Good morning and welcome to the April meeting of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. I'm so happy to see all of you here on this rainy day and I'm glad you made it. I, I waited a little bit to start because I know that you know some people were running into some pretty heavy rain. Uh, so I'm glad that you're here. We also have a couple of visitors with us today that I'd like to welcome. Uh, we have William Bartovic, who is our presenter's uh, brother-in-law, and we have Yusef Rogeria, who is with the, the Smiths. So welcome to you both. We're going to uh, get started with our wonderful program this morning, and I'm going to have our Vice President, Barbara Wooden, introduce our speaker. This morning we have Jeannie Vargas. A little bit longer. Oh my God. Jeannie has, can you hear me now? Yes. Jeannie has a master's degree in library and information science and has spent much of her career in public library service and administration. She worked in a public school library, a technical college library, and at the reference department at the University of Lowell. In 1998, she became the site administrator for the Townsend Historical Society, where she first learned of Nahum Hazard. And now I'd like to bring her forward to tell us about Nahum. Look encouraging. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeannie. So you heard I worked at the Townsend Historical Society in Massachusetts. In 1998, on my first week on the job, a young woman came into the office to do some research. Her name was Betsy Tennessee, a descendant of Nahum, no? Is there a volume down under the podium? A descendant of Nahum Gardner Hazard. I have an outside voice. <laughs> Use it. Use it. And she told me that the family had once lived in Townsend. I remember staring into the vault with a sinking heart. Filled at that time with piles of unsorted, unaccessioned papers and boxes of uncategorized photographs. I managed to locate the 1856 map, which showed the family on South Street in town. And then I listened as she told me some of Nahum's story. I was riveted. I was deep in it. It was not a story that could be forgotten. In 2001, Betsy produced a booklet under the Ages of Freedom's Way called The Story of Nahum, which I bought and read. I began to spread word of my interest to members of the Townsend Historical Society. And they brought me pertinent newspaper articles and pieces of information over the course of several years. It became clear to me that Nahum's descendants had been researching and sharing family stories over time. Can you hear me? Maybe if you hold what you're reading up so you speak in the mic. Okay. <laughs> um, both through Ancestry.com and numerous uh, newspaper interviews, there is, at least as of 2000, the Hazard Family of Color in New England, Inc., which sadly does not seem to have a website. I encourage any OGS members who may know any in the Hazard Family to see if they might be interested in sharing their stories in person. This is, after all, their story. I stand on many shoulders in putting together this presentation. But I have incorporated other additional documentation, collected photographs together from various locations into one place, and braided in family stories from different locations. Sources have been footnoted. I've also tried to provide a very brief 
broad brushed historical context to better understand the perils that Nahum Hazard experienced. I believe Nahum's story should continue to be shared as widely and frequently as possible and in as such depth as research allows. His story is part of a larger history and one which should haunt the nation. This is the story of Nahum Gardner Hazard. Early one September day in 1839, three men came up to the home of Kara Hazard, living near the border between Lunenburg and Shirley, Massachusetts. She was recently widowed and had four young children to support and raise alone. His, her eldest was eight, soon to turn nine, and his name was Nahum. One of the men told her he would provide the child with work in a tavern, upkeep, and an education. He assured Kara the little boy could come home whenever he wished. In hopes of a better opportunity for her son, Kara gave her consent, and Nahum went with them. He was African American. He had been born to parents with full free status. And he was a very little boy. He was a very little boy. And that was the day that Nahum Gardner Hazard was kidnapped to be transported to Virginia and sold into slavery. Nahum had been caught up in the vast net of a vicious criminal enterprise that stretched over 95 years after the American Revolution through the Civil War. The kidnapping of free American blacks for the purpose of selling them to slave traders. An early example is Jude Hall. Born into slavery in 1747, he fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill, as well as Ticonderoga, Trenton, and Saratoga, among other battles. He was an American patriot, settling in Exeter, New Hampshire, to marry and raise his family. At least two, possibly three of his sons, were kidnapped at separate times and sold into slavery. Jude Hall never saw any of them again. A man who fought for America's freedom as a black patriot saw his sons stripped of their own free status. During the time Hull's sons were kidnapped, the stage was already being set for a far-reaching underground criminal network. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 revolutionized the cotton industry by speeding the lengthy, tedious process of separating the cotton bowl from its seeds, production of cotton dramatically increased. Southern planters, slaveholders, expanded their planting, needing more labor. And then beginning in 1803, newly acquired American territories to the south and west allowed for these planters to expand their holdings even more planting additional cotton fields. They sent many of their slaves to some of these territories. Then soon after, in 1808, Congress voted to abolish the West African slave trade. This cut off the South's easy access to free labor. In short, the South wanted more slaves and was willing to pay for them. Thus a large and lucrative market in human trafficking emerged. The number of free black kidnappings, while largely undocumented, seemed to grow with frightening speed. In 1817, a small book was published on the topic, written by Jesse Torrey. He was a physician who in 1815 traveled from New York via Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia ending the journey in Washington, D.C. His original intent was to lobby Congress to raise monies 
so free, public, circulating libraries could be opened all over the country. However, what he observed and heard in his travels, and especially at his destination, redirected his passions and energies. He was horrified to witness the labors of enslaved people along his way and learned about the abduction of free African Americans and their enslavement for profit. What Washington, D.C., where heavy slave, slave trade went on, absolutely outraged him, and he deemed it, quote, an emporium of slavery. He saw a line of African Americans, men, women, and children, manacled together and marched along a street for transport and for sale. He listened to the stories about the kidnappings and went to speak personally to individuals who had suffered at hands that had stolen their freedom. He kept careful notes and in 1817 he wrote a book based on his findings which included five engraved illustrations entitled American Slave Trade or An Account of the Manner in Which the Slave Dealers Take Free People from Some of the States <coughs> and of the Horrible Cruelties Practiced in the Carrying On of This Most Infamous Traffic. Tory wrote of the nighttime break-ins when kidnappers stole family members and about a woman he interviewed as she lay in bed with two broken arms and a shattered lower spine, she had deliberately jumped from a third story garret window where she had been held to avoid being taken to Georgia. Her husband and children had already disappeared. Jesse Torrey wrote in the hope of igniting outrage such as he himself felt and inspiring action such as he himself had undertaken. Abolitionist newspapers also tried to raise the alarm and inform the public. African American communities worked to alert and protect their own population. Yet still, the inhumane underworld crime continued. Kidnappers, called manhunters by abolitionists, did not discriminate between so-called fugitive slaves and free blacks as targets. African Americans living in the free middle states along the Mason-Dixon line were especially at risk. Those states are but slave states and kidnappers simply cross state lines with their victims for ready sales. <laughs> Pardon me. In fact, that whole stretch of geography oops, came to be dubbed the reverse underground railroad the paths and byways forming an ugly inverted image of the routes used by those escaping enslavement and heading north. This was particularly true where whole gangs were formed to work large geographical swaths. The Cannon Johnson gang was perhaps the most notorious Patty Cannon, nay Lucretia Patricia Hanley, was the ringleader and seemed to have had the character and moral compass of Jesse James, Jack the Ripper, and Charles Manson. <laughs> she was said to have killed a child by deliberately burning him or her to death in the heart. She and her husband, Jesse Cannon, settled on the line where Delaware, a free state, and Maryland, a slave state, meet on the peninsula between the Delaware and Chesapeake Bays. They assembled a confederacy of like-minded criminals, violent and ruthless, though unknown in number. Two of these members purchased a small sloop, which was used for many of the abductions. Free African Americans would be lured on board with promises of jobs or in the case of children, treats. They would then be set upon, beaten, and chained. The ship might transport them directly to the south, where they were sold as slaves, or taken to the cannon headquarters and imprisoned, intended for later sale. 
Those who protested their free status were continually beaten until subdued, and some were killed in the process. Black gang members would be used as decoys, approaching targeted victims with the same lures used on the sloop and with the same results. When Patty's son-in-law purchased a tavern nearby, the headquarters expanded. It attracted a fair number of slave traders and the added benefit of money travelers whom the gang could rob. Ultimately, the gang's violent, nefarious activities drew public attention and notoriety. But when Patty Cannon was arrested, it was not on kidnapping charges. Despite the discovery of 21 free African Americans held captive in her house when she was taken in custody. She was charged with murder. What? Murder. 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 She was charged with murder. It seems a tenant farmer on Patty's land had unearthed a chest with bones and further investigation discovered many more bodies. From jail, Patty Cannon called for a priest and confessed to 11 murders, including her own three-day-old daughter from strangulation and her husband, my poison. She admitted to being an accomplice in at least a dozen others. On May 11, 1829, she died by her own hand, having smuggled poison into the jail. Her story was published in 1841, titled The Narrative and Confessions of Lucretia P. Cannon, who was tried, convicted, and sentenced to be hung at Georgetown, Delaware, with two of her accomplices. Whether working alone with others or in organized gangs, kidnappers use similar ploys, including promises of jobs or apprenticeships and physical attacks and capture. Children, given their size and natural naivete, were particularly easy to kidnap and thus very vulnerable. However, kidnappers were all primarily motiv motivated by greed. And the crime was highly lucrative. The South was an insatiably hungry for increased enslaved labor. And the price paid per person <coughs> increased throughout the early decades of the 19th century. Carol Wilson, a scholar of antebellum US history, has estimated that by the 1850s, slave prices soared with good field hands bringing at least $1,000 and some artisans selling for more than twice the amount. The white population was largely indifferent to the crime, both from apathy and ingrained racism. Those who attempted to help or to testify in a court were often intimidated by the kidnappers who threatened retribution. Abolitionist societies were of the most help, often the only help to victims raising monies to collect proof of free status and to fund the travels of those who tried to rescue the abducted one person at a time. Still, given the massive, if undocumented, scope of the crime, it would seem their efforts were akin to trying to empty the ocean with a sieve. And as for the law, well, it wasn't much help. Both the first fugitive slave law enacted in 1793 and the second in 1850 denied due process to anyone declared a fugitive slave, whether true or not. In an all too frequent ruse, it was used by kidnappers. In fact, any cases of kidnapping that found their way into court were supported only by white testimonies. No black was allowed to testify. Not the victim, not a relative, not an African American friend or neighbor. State laws were variable and unreliable in terms of enforcement. In Massachusetts, however, despite the fact that it was the first colony to legalize slavery in 1641, 
It abolished it in 1783 under its new state constitution. Then in 1836, the court decreed that any slave brought into the Commonwealth was considered free. And then, in 1839, the same year, can you hear me? The, the? The same year that Nahum Hazard was kidnapped, an interesting new ruling was enacted. At the time, a young man named George Bradburn yes. uh, served on the Massachusetts legislature. He happened to be a fiery abolitionist. This portrait is an inset from a larger painting of an anti-slavery conference held in London in 1840. In March 1839, well informed about the kidnappings that had been epidemic, Bradburn presented a legislative committee with his report, quote, on the deliverance of citizens liable to be sold as slaves, end quote, arguing for a legal mechanism for rescuing victims. As his report reached deep, deaf ears and blind eyes, he took to persuading the full legislature in a fiery speech, and the results were passed. Governor Edward Everett approved it, and its passage would directly affect Nahum Gardner Hazard. Nahum was born in the town of Shirley, Massachusetts, to Emerson Hazard and Kara Boston Hazard in 1830. He was descended from an extraordinary family. His paternal grandfather had been a black patriot serving in the Continental Army during the American Revolution when, according to the family, he lost two fingers. His service is documented in a pension record from 1835. He had been enslaved either in Connecticut or Rhode Island, as the family itself seems to disagree. It has been presumed he earned his freedom as the result of his war service, after which he went to Littleton, Massachusetts, and married Betsy Boston in 1786. Again, leaning on family stories, she was a Penobscot Native, Native American from Maine who with her brother had been kidnapped at a very young age. She and her brother were adopted by Philip Boston and his wife, both African American, and raised as their own in Littleton. Soon after 1790, he moved to Shirley. In fact, Thomas followed two persons of color who first moved there after the Revolution, along with four other freedmen. Thus began a small community of African Americans, <coughs> including Peter Boston, son of Philip Boston. It is believed they moved there because of a need for labor on the large hops growing farms. This is in part supported by the fact that they settled on Great Road, where two of the most successful farmers of this crop lived. One of them, James Parker, wrote in his diary about the number of hands he was using in his hops business, writing in 1803, Jam finished drying his hops all off. He paid the Negroes off, and I sent them home. One of Thomas Hazard's sons, Emerson, married Peter Boston's daughter, Chara and they had four children before Emerson's early death. They were Nahum, Oliver, Horace, and Betsy. Based on, good grief. Based on an 1830 survey map, a local historian recreated the dwelling places of early residents. Well, at the time of that writing, 1914, only cellar holes remained showing where the early African Americans lived. They were a long great road indicated by the yellow line on this map of Charlotte. Can you see it? Yes. In 1800, he is shown as Thomas Hazard, Negro, tenant of Cooper Shop, 
as is John Hennessy, who would be the father of Kara's second husband. The shop, which burned in 1818, was owned by James Parker, one of the two prominent hop scrollers. Hazard would later be found on Squanacook Road in 1812 and 1830 when he is listed as old. He owned his home. A later descendant had his original deed. Can you see in the northeast corner where the blue circle is? His son Emerson is not cited in these listings, but at some point he and his young family moved west of the town to Flat Hills in Lunenburg. The location at, is roughly at the Green X. Do you see the Green X? And this is where we find Mayhem on September 2nd, 1839, the day that he was kidnapped. He was playing in the road in front of his home when three men driving an open team came up and knocked on Kara Hazard's door. She knew one of them, William Little, who lived nearby on Little Turnpike Road in Shirley, as shown on the map with the blues. See it? Not much has been written of him, although one Shirley historian made an intriguing, if unflattering, comment, quote, he was obese, obscene, and deaf, end quote. The other two men were strangers to Kara, and they presented themselves under aliases, as a tavern keeper and his clerk. Their real names were Dickinson Shearer and Francis Wilkinson. Louder. <laughs> Most family accounts assert that the two men asked Kara if Nahum would accompany them on a cattle drive for handsome pay. But two more contemporaneous accounts, The Emancipator on October 10, 1839, and The Liberator on October 11, 1839, stated the men had offered an apprenticeship to the child until he was 20 years old promising he would be working in a tavern in Washington, Massachusetts, 60 miles away. Nahum's upkeep and education would be provided, and he could come back to visit whenever he wished. Kara, reassured by the endorsement of a known neighbor, gave her consent to the promising offer. The men took Nahum with them, and they drove away. After traveling a long time, well into the dust, Nahum grew cold. The men put him down under the buffalo road, where he fell asleep. And upon waking aboard a train, he inquired of the men where they were going with him. And the only answer he got was laughter for his tears. What? The only answer Can you repeat that? <coughs> oh, d you didn't hear the last sentence? No. no. I'm so sorry. I'm very bad at this. Okay. He inquired of the men where they were going with him, and the only answer he got was laughter for his tears. Had his captors given an honest response, the answer would have been Richmond, Virginia, where Wilkinson turned him over to Bacon Tate, a slave trader, who put Nahum in his slave jail to be held for auction and for sale. This was the same jail that became the infamous Lumpkins Jail, often referred to as the Devil's Half Acre. There he was branded as a slave. He had some hot pitch or wax poured on a shaven place on top of his head. And the steaming branding iron was applied while the wax was still hot. 
And in Nahum's own words, I had been put into a pair of pants of coarse cloth, a shirt made of old bagging, a blue swallowtail coat with brass buttons, several sizes too large for me. And on my head wore an old stovepipe hat. He was allowed to play with other boys in the jail. And here the various accounts all fully merge and agree. While playing marbles one day, he became bored. Having attended public school in Massachusetts, he made a shocking request of his jailer. He asked for a book to read. Now, in the South, of course, where African Americans had never been allowed to learn to read or write, this innocent request caused great shock and consternation. A black child who could read? The jailer questioned the little boy, can you read? Where are you from? Nahum had unwittingly provided the means for his own salvation. Nahum's answers proved unnerving to his captors, confirming he was an educated free child from the North. While the acts of kidnapping free blacks, transporting them across state lines, and selling them into slavery were technically against the laws of the country, they were not often vigorously enforced. But it so happened that there was an active vigilance committee, an abolitionist organization in Richmond. Word spread. Oh, did I blow a slide? Lumpkin's jail. I'm so sorry. Word spread about the literate black child, reaching the attention of William Jonathan Clark, connected with that vigilance committee. On September 21 and 22, Clark wrote to three men in Massachusetts who forwarded the letters to George Bradburn our legislator and fiery abolitionist. Bradbury traveled to Lunenburg to speak with the child's mother and confirm Nahum's identity. He found Kara in a meadow where she was picking cranberries. Bradburn wrote in a letter published in the Emancipator on October 10, 1839, that she had told him what had transpired on September 2nd and admitted she had been worried. She had never heard from the two strangers who took her son and had asked friends to help write letters of inquiry about his welfare. Brad Byrne informed her that Nahum was in Richmond and wrote, quote, joy enough, I assure you, was diffused through the bosom of his mother when I assured her that her son was safe and would soon be restored to her arms again. Bradburn ordered William Little from Shirley arrested for aiding and abetting kidnappers, then went to the governor. He requested that Everett appoint someone to identify Nahum and bring him back to his home, but he had to remind Everett of the April 1839 resolve, which Bradburn had spearheaded back in March that gave the governor the authority to do so. This read in part, resolved that His Excellency the Governor, whenever a citizen of this commonwealth is imprisoned in another of the states, on suspicion of being a slave, is hereby authorized to employ a suitable person to proceed to the state where the individual is so imprisoned, and to bring him to a place of safety and His Excellency is hereby empowered to draw his warrant on the treasury of this commonwealth to defray the expenses thereof. Everett appointed Major William Brown of Lunenburg, whom Bradburn had learned met New Nahum. He actually lived on Flat Hill and knew the hazards as neighbors. A major in the militia, a deacon, and a farmer he had sometimes hired Nahum to pick up the potatoes that he had hoed. He was also familiar with the journey to Richmond, 
where he's brought his palm leaf hats, braided by African Americans and whites alike, to earn money. Ironically, the hats were sold to slave owners for their field hands to provide a modicum of protection against the punishing southern side. By the time Brown arrived in Richmond, Nahum was frightened, traumatized, and deeply distrustful. He did not at first recognize Brown, who was dressed for travel, not for him. But Nahum remembered that Deacon Brown had a sore on his leg, which had never healed and prevented him from stooping. He would not budge until Brown had shown him the injured leg and thus proven his own identity. Nahum returned to Shirley with Major Brown, whose route and expenses were documented in his invoice to the state of Massachusetts for reimbursement. It was discovered by clerks in the office of the Secretary of State <coughs> in the late 19th century. They typed it up and sent it to the Lunenburg Historical Society. I have reproduced it here. As you can see, the round trip journey took 16 days from September 30th to October 15th. It was accomplished in stages between major cities along the route. Each fare is listed, as well as meals and lodging, including the return trip, when he brought Mayhem with him. Brown also purchased a vest and a pair of shoes for the child, at least partially replacing the absurd clothing that he had been dressed in. In total, the cost, including Brown's time, came to $116.18. Nahum was, quote, highly pleased to get home, which sounds like a startling understatement. Kara determined then and there not to hire him out again. While Nahum was still imprisoned in Richmond, one of his kidnappers had remained in Massachusetts. On September 12, another eight-year-old African-American child, this time from Worcester, was kidnapped. His name was Sidney Orison Francis, and his case was closely intertwined with Nahum. Two men approached. Talking to the mic, buddy. <laughs> I need to glue it. Sidney? His name is Sidney? Sidney. Last name? Francis. Thank you. Two men approached the child who was playing in front of his home and started talking with him. The child's mother, Diana Francis, opened the door and the men introduced themselves under aliases as a store owner in Palmer and his clerk. They said they were looking for a colored boy to replace the one currently working for them as the child and his family were moving. Mrs. Francis sent Sydney to the railroad depot to ask her husband for his permission. He reluctantly agreed but wrote down the men's names and address. Sydney went off with the men, another victim of kidnapping. Sydney's father, however, became uneasy after two days and set off on foot to Palmer to check on the well-being of his son. He was informed there that the child had been taken to a tavern in Washington, Mass, and he continued west on his fruitless journey. The two men, their real names being Dickinson Shearer and Elias Turner, did bring Sidney to Palmer, where they ate dinner with Shearer's brother Marcus and stayed the night with Turner's parents. Turner stayed behind while Shearer continued south with Sidney. They traveled by steamboat, by train, and by stagecoach. This image shows their route. It is the same route taken by Nahum's abductors. In Fredericksburg, they stopped at the Farmer's Hotel, where Sidney wandered into a barber shop and started reading the handbills and postings. This was witnessed by a man named Thomas Lipscomb, who was stunned to see a black child reading. Suspicious, he decided to investigate 
finding enough information to have Shearer arrested. By this time, however, Sidney had been sold to another party. Francis Wilkinson, a slave trader, who was one of Mayhem's kidnappers. Wilkinson had taken Sidney to his home in Cartersville, Virginia, confining him in his cellar with five other black children. You can see the turn to the northwest on the map where the journey ended. <coughs> Lipscomb, accompanied by law officials, took off after Wilkinson. They rousted him from his bed, rescued Sidney, and returned with both of them to Fredericksburg. Meanwhile, Mayor Benjamin Clark had written to the mayor in Worcester, Massachusetts, informing him of the situation and requesting documentation of Sidney's free status and any white witness who would know and vouch for Sidney as required by his own Virginia state laws. Wilkinson was in prison. Two brothers who knew Sidney, George and Benjamin Rice, were sent to Fredericksburg to vouch for it and then returned Sidney to Worcester. The Commonwealth leveled indictments against Dickinson Shearer and his nephew, Elias Turner, for the kidnapping. Efforts to extradite Wilkinson ultimately failed, and it is believed that he escaped from the highly insecure Fredericksburg jail. Elias Turner was arrested on September 27, 1839. With these events unfolding, news of the kidnappings began to be reported at least as early as October 2nd, and coverage continued throughout the month. The close connections between the kidnappers and the abductions of Mayhem and Sidney became public knowledge. On October 10th, both the Emancipator and the Liberator ran articles on the Worcester kidnappings announcing that Sidney's case seems to have disclosed the existence of an extensive combination of villains led by Dickinson and Shearer. He is said to have confessed, he has followed the business of kidnapping for six years past, and he is connected with a gang of kidnappers whose organization extends from New England to Virginia. The trial began on January 23rd, 1840, in Worcester's Court of Appeals, the building on the far right in this image. All the facts came out. The Francis family, including Sidney, provided invaluable testimony. What? What happened? Sorry. Witnesses who had been present when the child was taken spoke. Thomas Lipscomb gave compelling evidence having traveled from Fredericksburg complete with a broken arm, resting in a sling. One of the more interesting witnesses was Joshua Fowle, an overseer of Shirley's Poor House, who stated that Turner and William Little had earlier asked him about the availab availability of any black pauper boys they could take. The overseer had sent them away, quote, suspecting the fellows might be rogues. Little, of course, was Kara's neighbor, who had vouched for Wilkinson and Shearer at her door. <coughs> Pardon? Not yet. <coughs> I don't know I'm doing anything. Um, the real revelation of the trial, however, was the confirmation that Nahum and Sidney were both victims of the same group of organized kidnappers. William Francis Wil Wilkinson, of course, was a slave trader from Virginia, but the others all shared familial bonds. Shearer's brother and Turner's parents, who all testified and supported the defendants, were silent accessories who never faced prosecution. In fact, Hannah Turner had admitted that another black child had been brought to her home 10 days prior to Sydney's arrival, and that child was Nahum Hassett.
1841, two years after Nan's traumatic kidnapping, his mother, Kara, remarried to Benjamin Hennessy of Townsend. The family relocated there on the Red Dot, settling on South Street in the eastern part of town that's still called Townsend Harbor. Kara and Benjamin started their own family and eventually gave Nahum five half-siblings. The 1850 census shows Nahum living with them at age 19, occupation as farmer, having attended school within the year. Later, Benjamin and Kara moved to Warring Road, that's the blue dot, where they lived for the rest of their lives. Benjamin became something of a patriarchal figure. This photo is actually one half of a stereopticon image. On the back is written, Picnic at Home of Uncle Ben Hennessy's, and then added by an early curator, Burned, was located near Number 3 Warren Road, Townsend Harbor. Benjamin, described as having a thin, intelligent face and dignified bearing, was elected selectman in 1877. Nahum had left the Hennessy household by the 1855 state census, which lists him as living with the Dix family, along with six other relatives, most young, unmarried working men. In short, Nahum was born. His occupation was listed as teamster. Mike. Mike. He married Harriet Phillips of Concord, Massachusetts on November 4th, 1858. Here I rely on Betsy Tennessee's account that the marriage took place in Harvard, Mass, performed by Reverend Dodge. He, quote, was sympathetic to abolitionist causes and often married people of mixed parentage when other clergy would not. Harriet's grandmother was probably Native American. War records listed her grandfather as Negro. Nahum and Harriet settled in Townsend and started their family. But the advent of the Civil War would affect their lives. Recruitment literature targeting African Americans was widely distributed in Massachusetts, encouraging enlistment in so-called regiment, uh, colored regiments. Nahum's brothers Oliver and, ha ha Oliver and Horace signed up for the famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment, as did Nahum. African Americans who served in black regiments were at particular risk, as the Confederate States of America under Jeff Jefferson Davis had decreed that any black man serving in a northern regiment should be immediately e executed if captured. However, they might also be sold back into slavery. Nahum, who had been permanently scarred and branded as a slave when he was eight years old, was in particular jeopardy. But Nahum had never forgotten his experiences in the South. He saw the way the unfortunates of his race were kept, clothed, and fed, and the hardships they endured. He had determined in later years if he ever had the opportunity, he would do something to help them. And so he went south to fight for the freedom of the boys who were in the slave pen with him. The degree of courage and sense of purpose driving Nahum to enlist is truly awe-inspiring. As shown in the muster and descriptive role, he enlisted in the 54th Regiment on August 27. 1863 in Concord, Mass, for one year. He was described as a teamster in Townsend, who stood at 5'7", with black eyes and hair, and a dark complexion. As the 54th was filled, he was assigned to the 55th, another colored regiment. His service began at the Loop Island, in Boston on August 27, 
and he was sent to fight in South Carolina. His regiment was part of the Florida invasion where they fought in the Battle of Olaski. On heading back north, they saw fighting again in South Carolina. They engaged in the Battle of Honey Hill, where Nahum was wounded in the shoulder, an injury that would trouble him the rest of his life. When his year of service ended, he was discharged in Charlestown, South Carolina on August 29, returning to Townsend and his family. Nahum's brothers also survived the war. In all, these three Hazard brothers and at least nine cousins served in African-American regiments during the Civil War. <coughs> Nahum moved his family to Leominster sometime after the war. <laughs> Jimmy Cricket. Yes. Certainly he appears in the 1870 census, but listed as Gardner Hazard. It remains unclear when he began using his middle name, but he often went by, car, by guard. According to Betsy Tennessee, in addition to farming, he worked as a teamster in Leominster for a stonemason called Ewell. His team of horses usually consisted of six in two rows of three. They hauled cut granite slabs, often weighing several tons, from the Leominster Quarry on Granite Street back to the shop. When winter conditions prevented them from working in the quarry, they would work in Fitchburg, cutting and shaping curbstones. He and Harriet continued to have children through 1879, and there were eight who survived. They lived in the northern part of Leominster at 328 Prospect Street for most of their lives. He seems to have led a fairly quiet life, concentrating on family and work. Nahum became an active member of Lemonster's Grand Army of the Republic. Charles Stevens Post, 53. His war record is included here in a bound, oversized volume of personal war sketches. And he himself has signed it it was the first and only time I had ever seen his signature. <laughs> Nahum's wife passed away in 1879, and he died September 2nd, 1913. His death certificate stated cause of death as valvular heart disease with old age as a contributing factor. The day he died was the anniversary date of his kidnapping in 1839. He was two weeks shy of his 84th birthday. They, they were both buried in Townsend's Hillside Cemetery alongside their infant daughter, whose stone is engraved with the words, sleep on, sweet babe. Many years later, Nahum's brother Oliver, who had also moved to Leominster following the war, was honored by the city. He had signed up for the 54th Regiment and was sent into the service following the, it, the uh, famous Battle of Fort Wagner, later portrayed in the film Glory. The regiment had suffered so many losses that replacements were needed and Oliver was sent down to fight in the Battle of Austria. Oliver sustained a serious wound when a bullet tore through the flesh of his leg. That wound eventually proved disabling. In 2010, a monument was erected to commemorate the Civil War veterans. A bust of Oliver was sculpted to represent those veterans. The sculptor, Philip Cody, created a small bust for the Leominster Historical Society where it is proudly displayed and immediately visible when you enter the building. The much larger granite bust is located in Carter Park. When it was dedicated, all right, Al Hope, <laughs> Barbara Hope, computers and I need each other.
from across the country. Nahum's lasting legacy rests not in granite, but in the equally enduring memories of generations of his family. He repeatedly stressed the value of education and reading when sharing his story of the kidnapping with his children and with his grandchildren. They passed his stories on to their descendants, who continued to pass it on to the present day. In a 1912 newspaper article, published a year before his death, based on an interview with Nahum, the reporter states, in his old age he never tires of telling his story and the revenge he had in later years. His service in the 55th Regiment was that revenge against the institution of slavery and the agents that perpetrated it. It seems clear that Nahum's memories of playing marbles in the slave jail and the result of requesting a book to read were vivid and indelible. One of his grandsons remembered Nahum telling him simply, but so profoundly and eloquently, a book book saved my life. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, We are the Historical and Genealogical Society, and I think today we had a wonderful... We had a wonderful um, history lesson. And uh, maybe Jeannie could uh, still stay here. Others may have questions. If you have some questions or comments that you might have, I know usually our members do have have questions and comments, so I don't want to deprive you of that opportunity. Any questions? Do you have your presentation in book form? In book form? Yes. Did it seem like it was cool? <laughs> <laughs> I have, what I did was I did bring, um, can't hear you. I did bring the formal paper, mm-hmm. and I have it on my computer. And if you want to leave me your um, email address, I can send it as an attachment, and it has the end notes and the bibliography. I would suggest that perhaps you submit it for publication <laughs> yeah. uh, in the Odds Journal. Really? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm very flattered. I think you've done some very good research, yeah. and um, our editor is really looking for um, well-documented mm. articles. I, I served for a few years as a reviewer of articles, yeah. and sometimes we get articles that are not very well documented. Uh, and this, you know, what you shared with us today was extremely documented. I didn't, you know, I haven't seen your footnotes, yeah. but just listening, uh, you, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know that you have lots yeah. of them. So this yeah. is the kind of of article that we would love to have published mm-hmm. in the uh, Odds Journal. Mm-hmm. And I would recuse myself. I would not review it because I would be biased. <laughs> but. Uh, but I would encourage you to do that before sending it around to people. Um, yeah, yeah. Let it be no. published. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you indicate that you are an odds member. Yeah. Yeah. So I would encourage you to do that. And I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you the information. I can't email it to anyone. You can email it to me and I'll submit it uh, on your behalf. All right. And, and what about the images? Some of the images of uh, yeah. Well, as long as you have um, permission. Yeah, I, I can get permission. <laughs> mm. 
so that we won't be violating copyright, I think that would be that would be very good. So okay. I will send it to Stella. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and perhaps in in uh, you know within the next. I don't know what, what's planned for the next uh, journal, but uh, you know what the cycle is right now. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I would strongly recommend that. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Take care of it. I'll, I, you can send it to me, and I, I'll work with you on making sure that it's submitted. All right. Okay. I, Linda, oh, I didn't think it would come to this. Okay. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle of the presentation, you said his occupation, and I didn't hear that. So. He was listed as farmer sometimes, uh -huh. but usually as teamster. Teamster? Mm. Oh. Teamster. Mm. And um, if he was hauling these enormous slabs of granite with teams of six horses, yeah. I think he must have done quite well for us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You, you never thought you share the mic with her? That, you never thought share about the mic with in book form? Sure. Yeah. Uh, putting it on why is it in book form. <laughs> Well, it's not long enough. I, I made myself cut it off at 19 pages because I didn't want the audience to fall asleep. So you have more material. <laughs> there you go. And it there you be. go. There is more research to do. Yeah, I was listening to her saying it, that it's 19 pages, so it could very easily uh, be, uh, you know, like part one may be published in one. Uh, one issue, and then the next issue, part two. Mm -hmm. I mean, American Ancestors uh, and, and the National Genealogical Society do that quite often. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, okay. we'll, we'll have to work on that. I saw another hand. I just wanted you to share the mic with oh, her. Oh, okay. You can't hear her. I, I'm just hogging the mic, right? Yes. <laughs> as long as she remembers to hold it there. <laughs> I, I have a problem with technology. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep it right there. Okay. No, the problem yep. isn't with you. The problem is with the heat. The oh. The blowers yeah. are going all the time. Yeah, it that's is. That's why we can't hear you. Oh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. No, it's not your fault. Yeah, not your Don't fault. Don't apologize again. All right. <laughs> Any other uh, questions Any or other comments? comments? Phyllis. Yes. Let's give Phyllis the mic. So I, I was not... I was not aware that there was so much kidnapping. Twelve years a slave, and uh, you brought that forth, and you know, showing how it was much more prevalent than I had thought. But I uh, thank you very much for sharing this with us because the resiliency of of Nahum and uh, what he was able to accomplish despite all he went through. I mean, it just gives us you know, pause to think about all that they've endured and how strong they are. Inspirational. Yes. Um, I have to, uh, hold on one sec, Mark. I, I have to say that um, there's very little written about black kidnappings. No. Very little. I found two books. And there were some articles. I did best with The Liberator mm -hmm. from 1839. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> I think my major feeling reading about it was real anger. Where was this in my history books? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. High school, college, nowhere. No. Yes, Barbara. How long, how long was it that he was gone? Well, he was kidnapped on September 2nd. And he returned home on October 16th. So it would have been about six, rough, six weeks rough, mm -hmm. irritating. Mm -hmm. It was within the same year. Yes. The same story was brought up at the convention of, in New Jersey. In New Jersey, they had a judge and you would go before the judge before they took you away. And you had to agree to go. And they even used infants. If the infant said anything while he was in front of the court, they would say he was saying yes. If he babbled, that was considered yes. And they would send him south. And that, that, and that was in a town in New Jersey. It was brought up at the convention that, that we went to. That any any uh, utterance at all was saying that you agreed to uh, go south, at, you know, to pick cotton. 
it, it was really horrific. The, yeah. the reading was very hard to do. Yeah. Um, they would jail people for no cause and lock them up. And then when they couldn't pay the bail fees, they would send them south. <coughs> they would destroy their papers of freedom. I just want to say you did, I mean, an excellent job. I, I'm fascinated. Have you done research on any other families that, that you found oh. or are interested in right now and can pursuing? You want me to take on any projects? <laughs> <laughs> Not, yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I get interested in things, and then there's no pulling me back. Mm -hmm. So if you know of an intriguing person, mm -hmm. let me know. I can see what I can find. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, sometimes you research stumble across something else. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was so hard to stick to my topic. I'd want to go off on these rabbit trails that sounded so interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't go down, get the blinders back. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, speaking about you, your your uh, references, what references did you use to find this information? They were scattered all over the place, including the internet. Do you want to see my bibliography? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I can't rattle them all off. <laughs> <laughs> how many pages? I've graded two pages of end notes and two pages of bibliography. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's very, very good. Well, I think we're going to wrap up now. It's 11.58. We have a couple more minutes. Um, we usually try to stop at about noon. So why don't we uh, uh, take this opportunity to take a little bit of, of a break. I know people have been sitting for a while. And um, we will reconvene. I typically like to reconvene no later than 12.30. But I think today, uh, perhaps we should try to reconvene about 12.20.